Good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome back to another one of your flip lectures. So today we're going to be talking about labor in the Gilded Age. So uh, we took a lot of time looking at, um, you know, the wealth of this era, call it, we're going to call it the Gilded Age. So today what we're going to do is take a look at kind of the other half of that equation, the workers, the ordinary people um, who are not the J.D. Rockefellers, the Andrew Carnegie's of this era. And so one of the big things that is going to change um, with the Gilded Age is that the rise of big business is going to mean more conflict between management and labor. The more employees you have, right, the more workers you're going to have, the more issues that are going to arise. And um, working conditions in industrial America are not very good for the worker. Um, they're often very unhealthy and dangerous. Um, heavy machinery accidents are commonplace. Um, the inhalation of fumes, dust, lint uh, due to poor ventilation is common. Um, your wages are very, very low. Um, the average in uh, 1900 uh, is about 59 hour work week. Uh, so that's more than the 40 hours that you would consider to be the work week. And you would be paid about 22 cents an hour. So it's really not a lot to not a lot to live on. And beyond this, if you are an unskilled laborer, you have almost no protections. Um, there are very few laws dealing with labor. There's no disability yet. Um, and so really, if you are a worker, you are very, very vulnerable to exploitation. And especially if you are an immigrant in this era, maybe unfamiliar with the culture, the language, whatever it is, uh, you are even more vulnerable without that understanding of how maybe the American system works, or like, I mean, in the American legal system, or perhaps, um, you know, language barriers, things like that. So whenever you have kind of a group of workers who feels like they are exploited, they don't have a voice, um, they are going to probably look to form what is known as a labor union. So what a labor union is, it is a organization of workers who come together for the purpose of what we call collective bargaining. So collective bargaining is that you allow the union to represent and bargain, right, do a deal on behalf of all of the workers. And so if the union signs that deal, all the workers get it. If the union strikes, all the workers are going to strike. And so we call that type of a deal a union contract. Um, I used to work at Dominic's grocery store. Uh, I was part of the union. I had a union contract. And so the reason the unions exist is pretty simple. You guys can think about it in this way. Um, if each of you comes to me individually and asks for the homework to get moved back, I'm going to tell you no, 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 right? You have no sort of power over me or anything like that. But individual, but so in the individual in that situation is weak, but strength in numbers. If a large group of students, you know, appoint someone to come speak to me and said, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we need. I would have to listen to you more the more people that there were. And so individual workers lacking the power to negotiate with their bosses, turn to strengthen number to give themselves some power, some leverage in these negotiations uh, with the business owners. And so the goal of a union is to prevent the exploitation of an individual. Um, and in this era too, um, child labor is also kind of widespread. Today, right, child labor, not really a thing, or at least it's not legal. Um, and so you also have, on top of just the regular workers uh, who are going to be vulnerable, you also have this large group of people who are literally children who are especially vulnerable um, to any sort of kind of labor, exploitation, um, unhealthy work conditions. And so this kind of thing is going to be the impetus, kind of the reason why labor unions are going to start to form. And again, some of these pictures that we look at, they're kind of heartbreaking. So the fight for uh, unions really starts with an industry, starts within the factory. And um, basically industrial unions, the idea of forming this is that you get all the workers in a particular industry. So the auto workers industry, the steel workers industry. Um, and if you get that many people together, then you have a lot more bargaining power than you might have otherwise. And so the industrial union then does bargaining with management. If they stick together, they believe they'll get a better deal. And the deal they strike, every person in the union gets that same deal. But let's think about it on the other end. If you were trying to maximize your profit, right, seeking that profit motive, well, you don't want your workers to organize because you might have to pay them more and they might work fewer hours and you are going to end up losing money. And so companies are going to enlist all sorts of legal as well as illegal means of breaking up strikes and making sure that unions didn't form. 
Um, they would do things like blacklisting, where anyone who was suspected of being, of trying to organize one of these unions or being a leader trying to organize one of these unions, your name would get put on the list and all the businesses would be told not to hire you. And so you go from job to job and they'd say, no, we don't want you. No, you don't, we don't want you because you'd be on the blacklist. You'd be known as somebody who would, you know, fight for unions. Um, so failing blacklisting, um, sometimes strike breakers would be employed. Now, there are two types of strike breakers. One are just workers who are not in the union who will go in and work. And essentially, as a union is striking outside, they go in and work. And so the business is not losing money. And the goal of that is to make the workers realize that they are replaceable and that the longer they stay out, the more likely it is they're going to lose their job entirely. Now, the second type of strike breaker is the kind that uses bricks, bats, knives, and guns in this era in order to intimidate, use violence, and even assassinate uh, labor leaders and people in this time. And so there's a lot of money on the line. And the government is fully on the side, at least at this point in history, on the side of industry, on the side of the business owners. So if we think about right strategies that workers can use to influence a business really their only weapon is their refusal as a worker your only weapon is your refusal to work you can't burn down the factory you can't do any of that stuff you can simply just refuse to work and so striking is the same as a boycott right you try to hurt somebody's money to make them deal with you and so the fight to unionize um, strikes is going to be the main weapon and so two big organizations that kind of i guess i'd say they lay the foundation for what will become unions in america um, starts with the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor. Um, so Knights of Labor and American Federation of Labor kind of establish for us what unions are really going to be all about in this era. The first is they want collective bargaining rights. They want the right for the union, not the individual, but the union to be able to negotiate with the bosses. Uh, they also want an eight hour work day. Um, they wanted an end to child labor. And actually, the Knights of Labor, uh, they were the first to advocate in America for equal pay for women, equal pay for equal work for women. Um, so the Knights of Labor also had these dreams about the workers owning factories and things like that. But in general, this idea of plain and simple unionism came to represent the eight-hour workday um, as well as collective bargaining rights. That was kind of plain and simple unionism. And then the idea of the closed shop is that in order to work at a particular factory, it was necessary for you to be in the union. And so that would, again, the workers believe, protect them against people from the outside coming in. And so one of the most successful, or I don't know if you call it successful, but the largest of these strikes is the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. And, in it, oh. and so that Great Railroad Strike of 1877 um, actually played out um, on our Chicago streets at the intersection of 16th and Halstead. Um, it became known as the Battle of the Halstead Viaducts. And as railroad workers across the entire country in 1877 tried to literally stop the railroad, stop any trains from moving across the entire country, a showdown between um, National Guard troops and the striking union workers ended up in a firefight that left a number of people dead on the streets of Chicago. And so these strikes were often violent. Um, they often resulted in casualties. But the goal of the workers, again, is to shut down the business. And the goal of the business owner is to do everything they can to keep it open. Um, another great labor story uh, that took place in Chicago took place at a place called Haymarket Square. You can see it's right in the middle of downtown. Um, it's now a place where you can buy a hamburger for like $30. Um, but it used to be one of the centers of the, of the labor movement in the city of Chicago. And so, the, and so what happens at Haymarket Square actually begins very close to where school is, Blue Island and Western. And so at Blue Island and Western used to be the McCormick Reaper plant, where people worked manufacturing farm tools and other things like that. Those workers had gone on strike, and there had been a few altercations between strike breakers and police, especially, um, and these workers who were trying to, you know, strike and shut down the business. And so on May 3rd of 1886, um, after several clashes um, with police, after somebody was killed, uh, some of the organizers of these protests called for a big meeting in the middle of Haymarket Square. And August Spies, he's an immigrant, gets up on top of a wagon and he begins giving a speech about the need for the union and the eight-hour workday and to stick together. 
And in the crowd are strikers and a large number of police. And then somewhere, a bomb goes off. Boom! No one knows where it came from. No one knows who set it off. But once that bomb blows up, oh, the police, the protesters, anyone who is armed begins opening fire and begins fighting. 11 people are going to die. By the time the smoke settles, um, the leaders of the strike are arrested. August Spies, the guy giving that speech up there, um, he is hung publicly in Chicago as an example. And so for a lot of people in Chicago, this kind of undermined the union a little bit because they believe like, oh, they're anarchists, they're violent, they want to blow things up. And so workers kind of have to deal with this violence as they are trying to organize throughout this time. Um, so if you guys are interested, um, when it reopens, the Chicago History Museum has a ton of artifacts from this time, from this event, and it's one of the most kind of, I guess, iconic Chicago events. Uh, today, there are dueling monuments in the city, uh, one, to the, one to the protesters, rioters, strikers, and one to the police, um, you know, who, who were also involved. So for people who believe that the workers are right, the police are murderers. And to those who believe the police were right, the protesters are murderers. And so we can see that kind of a lot of this, like, kind of way of thinking and battling, um, it's been around for a very long time, right? The rhetoric, the way that we think about things, and then, you know, violence and so um, so another great labor story in Chicago is actually the Pullman strike of 1894. So if you know where the Pullman neighborhood is, uh, Pullman neighborhood is on the way south side, right? It's down past Chatham, Calumet Heights. Um, so, you know, you can see Gage Park and Washington Park up at the top there. So Pullman is, Pullman is on the far south side. Um, but Pullman originally started um, as, a com as a town for, sorry, not a town, a neighborhood for the workers for the Pullman sleeper car company. They would build these, these railroad cars that you'd sleep in. They would maintain them and all sorts of stuff like that. And so what ends up happening is that this company um, has about 6,000 workers. And these workers all pretty much live around the factory. And so the apartments and the houses are all owned by the Pullman Palace Car Company. We call that a company town. When the person that you work for is also the person who you rent from, also the person whose store that you go to. And so in the Pullman neighborhood, uh, we have this data, rent was about 25% higher than any other area in the city. So they're paying more because they're working with a company they don't have choice, right? Supply and demand. This is monopoly. And so in the Depression of 1893, um, the Pullman company has to cut workers' wages. They say, yeah, we're operating at loss, we're losing everything. And so they cut salaries. That happens in a depression sometimes. But what they don't do is lower the rent. So workers are making less, and they still have to pay this high rent. So the workers decide, we're not going to do this. We are going to go out on strike. And so on May 10th of 1894, the 6,000 workers of the Pullman Palace Car Sleeping Company, uh, they walk out. They walk out, and they begin their strike. So joining the strike is actually going to be um, the National Railway Union, the American Railway Union, supported by their leader, uh, Eugene V. Debs. Um, I don't know, his, his name might come up. Um, he's a big kind of labor leader in this time. Um, he decided to spread this strike from Chicago to the whole nation. And so railway workers everywhere basically refused to work on any train that had a Pullman car. And almost every train in this time has a Pullman car. And so, again, the railroads halt to a stop. Country is paralyzed. Commerce isn't happening. Travel isn't happening. And so the workers are winning the strike, or so it appears. And so Eugene V. Debs is kind of out there. Um, you know, he's agitating. He's trying to get um, you know, a deal done. But the Pullman Palace Car Company um, contacts President Grover Cleveland and saying, hey, this is a national emergency now. Right, it's a national emergency, asked the president to send in the United States Army. And President Grover Cleveland, at the behest of George Pullman, the owner of the company, sent in the troops in order to break up this strike. And so, obviously, um, when we're going to have a situation, violence is going to break out as it has in all these other strikes. Um, and so riders are going to try to down, try burn down buildings, they're going to try to rip up tracks, and so the soldiers are going to open fire into the workers, Four are killed, 20 are wounded, and the strike is going to collapse after this. And so almost all of these labor battles, um, the United States government is intervening on the side of the government, on the side of, sorry, the government is intervening on the side of the company. 
So what is going to have to change is that someone in government, we're going to call him Franklin D. Roosevelt, is going to have to become pro-union. And so by the end of the strike, a thousand out of those 6,000 workers were fired straight up for their role in the strike. Those that are going to sign back up to work have to sign contracts promising not to join a union. Eugene B. Debs is jailed for six months for insurrection uh, and all sorts of stuff. And so in the cities, labor battles are fierce. But they're arguably even more fierce in the country, in the places where the newspapers don't go. And so in the, in the West Virginia and Pennsylvania coal fields, some of the most brutal labor violence is going to accompany some of the worst working conditions. And in 1921, um, at, a, at a place called Blair Mountain, um, this is in West Virginia, I've been there, you should go there, it's a beautiful place, um, coal miners basically went to war over, with, with a company over a union. So the coal company in this West Virginia coal field had actually hired a private army, private detectives, a private army, in order to literally assassinate pro-union leaders. They actually assassinated several leaders in what was known as the Matawan Massacre. And so, believing that the government would not help them, the coal miners actually armed themselves, took to the hills, and began fighting a full-scale war against the company and its private army. Eventually, to end the Battle of Blair Mountain, the United States Air Force was ordered to bomb the mountain where the workers were hiding out and dug in. This is the first use of the United States Air Force in combat, and it is used to stop a labor dispute. And so we can start to see, right, kind of the pattern of all that. So early unionization. It's got a violent history. There are murders. There are riots. There's the Battle of Blair Mountain. And most workers by 1914, they are not in unions. They're not. That's going to take a lot more time. But there is this kind of foundation there for the increase of union membership, of power. And then by the 1930s, the federal government will finally recognize labor unions' right to exist, and they will actually regulate them using the National Labor Relations Board. So things are going to change. That early history, very violent. So in the 2000s, in the 20th century, there, there are kind of still controversies surrounding unions. So the workers in the coal fields um, in the 1880s is not necessarily right, the same as where we're at in 2021. And so a lot of people who are going to argue that unions are not all good will make kind of some of the following arguments. One, they'll point to corruption. Um, unions at time have been corrupt. Um, some unions have had historical ties to organized crime. Um, and that's a shame, right? Because workers are supposed to rep the union is supposed to represent the workers. Um, also, too, uh, unions are now beyond labor. Um, a lot of different unions now exist, including public employee unions. Um, government workers who negotiate with politicians whom they elect, uh, not with business owners who they're in a conflict over money with. And so there's this question about public employee unions, like teachers unions, is there a conflict of interest um, in having them? I don't know. Then there's also the loss of American jobs to countries with cheaper labor, and people will point to the fact that our workers get paid a lot more than those other workers. So again, you know, there's two sides to everything. And then kind of the last big controversy, one that's probably the biggest one today, is whether or not you should have to join a union. Um, some states have what's called right to work, where you can refuse to join a union and closed shops are illegal. Um, Illinois is not one of those states. When I worked for Dominic's, I had no choice but to join a union. And so there are two sides to that, right? One is the individual should have choice. The other is, you know, without the union being in control, the workers may not have protection. So plenty of controversies dealing with labor nowadays. But when we're talking about kind of in this time in the past, they are a very, very necessary piece of reforming the way that Americans are going to work. So just very, very briefly, I just want to point out a few things about the city, and then we'll be done uh, with this one. So, um, so in this time, we talked about this a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of give you some numbers here. Um, cities are going to grow a lot. They grow from about 10 million cities in the country to 30 million. New York becomes a city of 3.5 million, Chicago 2 million. So basically, all the stuff we're talking about, it's concentrating populations in these urban centers. 
And so a lot of immigrants, right, who come into these urban centers, they settle in cities where there are people who speak their language, right? There's culture, there's people they might know there. And also you stay close to where you come into the country. New York becomes the center of immigration in the United States. Um, industrialization, right, concentrates jobs with factories. Um, a lot of farmers actually leave the farm to come to the city because those jobs pay better a lot of the times. And then finally, kind of the utilities of the city, lights, plumbing, running water, libraries, theater, baseball, all of these things really kind of draw people to the city the way that they, that they still draw people to the city today. So a couple of new things, we're gonna have you know, new styles of architecture, skyscrapers, these huge buildings, right? Huge churches, libraries, theaters. All you have to do is take a walk around downtown and you can see this, right? All you have to do is take a walk around the city and you can see all this, right? Uh, public transit is new because you can't have everyone on horse and buggy and you can't have everyone on the sidewalk walking, right? So you gotta have public transit. Um, this is also where we see class separation, right? There are rich neighborhoods and there are poor neighborhoods and they never cross. And that becomes, unfortunately, a big part of the legacy of the city. And obviously, when you pile a bunch of people on top of each other, you got crime, you got disease, you got pollution, you got fires, you got, you got all sorts of things. And so the city is going to be a new type of place. A place where you can watch a baseball game. A place where you can watch a football game. A place where you can go, you know, and ride the Ferris wheel eat a hot dog at Nathan's, you know, down on Coney Island, go catch a show. And so a lot of this stuff is just drawing Americans to the city. And what's happening in the city becomes American culture. But as you guys read in Maggie Girl the Streets, um, a lot of Americans are living in what we call slums, right? Tenements, where there is very little air, very little light, there are terrible conditions but these are but there are no rules about this right there's not fire safety laws yet there's none of this and so what we're going to have to take a look at with all of these types of pictures and everything else is that Americans once they saw that big contrast between you know JD Rockefeller and Maggie girl of the streets a reform movement is going to be born and that reform movement starts with this idea of just simply looking at the world and saying, is it good? Is it the way that it's supposed to be? And the first people to do this are actually called the muckrakers. Um, the muckrakers are investigative journalists. They go undercover into the slums, into these factories to see you know, child labor. And what they do is they write investigative reports, they take photographs, and they show Americans what is happening in their country. And we're gonna read a bunch of their stuff and look at a bunch of their photos um, in class. So we also have, like Mark Twain calls this time, the Gilded Age, right? It's gold on the outside, and it's crap on the inside. Uh, Henry George, he's a very famous philosopher and writer, writes progress and poverty. Public schools are expanded and funding for them goes up. Um, there's a literary movement that Maggie is a part of that emphasizes that like the world, some person's natural circumstances matter a lot to who they become. And so you get the founding of all these charities and social organizations, Salvation Army, YMCA, um, Hull House, which helps settle immigrants, that are all aimed at trying to solve these problems. Eventually, the biggest tool, the federal government of the United States is going to get involved. But in this era, there's a lot of change. And so there's going to be a fierce reaction to try to fix some of the negative impacts of that change. So thank you guys for your attention, and we will see you in class.